Good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening, everybody, uh, wherever you are in this uh, planet. Uh, let me welcome you uh, to this uh, webinar organized by the uh, Initiative on Rethinking uh, Food Markets and Value Chains for Inclusion and Sustainability. But the webinar is also um, uh, under the platform, uh, the knowledge platform for inclusive and sustainable uh, food markets and value chains, KISM. Um, uh, which you're welcome to visit at any point in time, the platform which provides information about this initiative. Uh, today's uh, seminar will focus on uh, parts of a broader study uh, being undertaken and led by uh, Thomas uh, Reardon, who will be up our main speaker, um, about um, innovations um, and dynamic changes that are taking place in food supply chains around the world. So today's uh, webinar will focus on the dynamic growth of supply and demand for nutrient dense foods, focusing on what's happening in, in Africa, dynamic changes are taking place in fruits and vegetables and animal source foods uh, markets. Uh, the topic will be introduced, as I already mentioned, by Professor uh, Tom Reader, who's the um, university, the distinguished university professor at the Michigan State University for Agriculture, Food and Resource Economics, as well as a non-president senior research fellow at IFPRI. He'll give a, a, a brief introduction to the main topic and the main findings the research questions that remain about this dynamic growth and the changes taking place in the nutrient dense food markets uh, in Africa, but also the policy implications of his findings. And then we have uh, the pleasure to um, have the participation of um, Christy Cook, who's a senior policy advisor in the policy division of the USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, who will be the first discussant on this topic. And uh, second, uh, Diane Aldi, who's the uh, director of the Nutrition, Diets and Health Units at IFPRI, uh, but also a lead of a CGIR initiative on fruits and vegetables uh, labeled uh, fresh. So we very much look forward to our discussion uh, today. Um, Professor Ritter will speak for about 20 minutes, then followed by 50 minutes of comments from Christy Cook and Diana Aldi. And then we'll give it the, your, a chance to raise questions from the floor. But as we move forward, please submit your questions in the chat box uh, of this um, the Zoom link um, as we move forward so we can collect them and uh, present them to uh, Tom and uh, Christy and Diane as discussants for our further discussion towards the end of the uh, seminar. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Tom for his presentation. Over to you, Tom. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And the topic is on the dynamic growth of supply and demand for nutrient dense foods in Africa. <clears throat> and we'll draw some policy implications. And this has come out of a review of evidence and the literature that we did for Rethinking Markets uh, focused on both consumption of fruits and vegetables and animal products and supply of these, both at a macro level and what we call meso booms, where there's been um, at a meso level uh, uh, clusters of farmers and midstream actors that have combined to produce these uh, products and supply them to the market. Tom, can you start your video, please? Can you see sure. me? Yes. Thank you. And <clears throat> our emphasis will be on the dynamism of the growth of this demand and supply. Uh, and that's recognizing that there's significant problems of shortfall in consumption per capita 
of fruits and vegetables and animal products in Africa. So this is not turning away and putting an optimistic light and saying that we've already attained the necessary nutrition levels, but to put an emphasis on the fact that there's very rapid growth that's taking place both in consumption and supply of these products in Africa, and to think about what the policy and research implications of that rapid growth is, even though it's still not adequate for the needs. Okay. This is based on a report that we note here with various authors. <clears throat> I'll start by talking about the grassroots boom in agri-food value chains in Africa and focus first on the demand side. There's really been a huge and rapid demand of growth in food markets in Africa in general. If you think about urbanization that's taken place, which has brought uh, the continent to maybe 40% or 45% of overall population in cities, the total share of food consumption is greater than the share of population in cities. So it's about 60% of all food in Africa is consumed in cities. And this share and the amount is growing very rapidly. Of the 40% of food consumption that is in rural areas in Africa, we've found that 65% of that food is purchased. This is a far cry from the old view of farmers uh, growing what they eat and eating what they grow. Instead, there's farm households and rural households in general are purchasing a lot of their food. An example for fruits and vegetables uh, comes from Senegal, where 76% of rural consumption of fruit and vegetables is from purchases. And in Tanzania, 60% is from purchases. So the markets for these products are very active, both in urban areas and in rural areas. Besides the demand growing, there's been a matching, very rapid growth of uh, the supply of nutrient-dense foods in Africa. And most of the supply, because imports form a very tiny share of total consumption of fruits and vegetables and animal products in Africa, almost all of the consumption is coming from domestic supply chains. And these have been growing quickly. If we just look at the data in the past decade, farm output of animal products rose 29%. That's pretty comparable to what happened in Asia at 31% in the same decade. There was a rise of 43% in fruit output. This is faster than what's been occurring in Asia, 26%, and 35% in vegetable output versus 25% in Asia. So it's often in the debates uh, said that, well, Africa is lagging behind Asia, not as a dynamic a food economy, but in many of our studies, we found that the African uh, supply situation is as dynamic as in Asia or more. And then if you look at a few other products in the past two decades, there's been an 160% growth in the output of dairy and 280% in poultry and eggs and 70% increase in fish output. So these are very similar numbers to Asia in its own boom times. And <clears throat> that supply has been responding to the, the demand <clears throat> and the farm supply and the responding to the demand side and the output from the farm side has been a very rapid growth of the midstream of the value chains. <clears throat> the midstream being processors, wholesalers, logistics agents. And we argue that <clears throat> the value chain midstream is really should be called the hidden middle. In the international debate, very often one hears that this midstream is a missing middle. Uh, and a continuous call for the need to invent and support and start <clears throat> these services of the missing middle. But we found in our work that it's not a missing middle, it's a dynamic, growing and innovative midstream. So we call it the hidden middle because it's just hidden and neglected and usually ignored in the debate. And that midstream is comprised of uh, wholesalers and processors agro-dealers, truckers, et cetera. And there's hundreds of thousands, even millions of micro and small and medium enterprises that are growing and entering the market with an extremely rapid proliferation and growth in output value chains, in terms of wholesalers and processors, 
in the input value chains in terms of agro dealers and in lateral value chains providing, for example, logistics such as trucking and warehousing. And we found that a lot of this growth in the midstream is in spontaneous clusters. These are not agro parks or things that have been set up or managed. And so we find that the, the growth in the midstream is often in a grassroots growth without NGO support, without direct government support or management or subsidies, no formal bank credit, but lots of self-financing and financing through friends and family and no contracts with big companies. So these are the cases that we go over in the report. <clears throat> but very crucial in all of these uh, cases of what we call meso booms are enabling conditions. And very often these are public investments. The wholesale markets are absolutely crucial in all of these stories. And usually wholesale markets are off the screen of policy debates, but they but 80% of the food in Africa moves through these wholesale markets. They're off the screen of policy debates often because they're run by municipal and district governments and not by national governments. So they fall outside of the jurisdictions of various interlocutors in these debates, but they're central. Second, we found that roads and road quality is central to these stories of booms. Electricity grid is often a very central element. And security against bandits and bribes has, uh, is a central part of a lot of these stories. So we call those enabling conditions the bones and blood of the food system that are present over and over again in these studies that we show. And very crucial is the symbiosis or the living together between this hidden middle of the midstream and the farms themselves. The hidden middle that I just described needs the farm surplus. So this is not an argument against investment in farm productivity. Rather, the hidden middle can't function without a surplus coming from the farm. At the same time, the farms need the direct support of the hidden middle for import, for inputs, for transport, to market their outputs. And also farmers very often receive and need indirect support of the hidden middle in the form of loans, of training, of delivery. So the hidden middle and the farms are in this very intense symbiosis and are growing together. So the key messages so far is that there's dynamic value chain growth in Africa on demand and supply sides. There's a hidden middle, not a missing middle, and it's booming. The hidden middle and farms need each other or neither grows. And finally, these booms have very often been grassroots, and, but they depended on enabling conditions, the bones and blood of the food system, the infrastructure and the governance. We have highlighted a number of cases in the report of uh, these meso booms, and I'll just say a few of them. One that's very exciting <clears throat> is our work for USAID uh, in Tanzania on fruits and vegetables. We found that the fruits and vegetables wholesale markets tripled in the past three decades. Uh, in, in each of the decades, as they were tripling, the number of wholesalers in the markets doubled. So there was essentially a six-fold increase of this wholesale sector in Tanzania, very much off the radar of any of the policy debate that's occurring in Tanzania, a hidden middle, but not missing. At the same time, feeding that huge wholesale boom are uh, the growth in vegetable farm output. This grew 2.4 fold uh, in terms of vegetables <clears throat> and fruits output grew sevenfold in three decades. <clears throat> Within this, there was a special boom in tomatoes, a 4.4 times growth in tomatoes. So you said the skyrocketing vegetables. In 2008, only 8% <clears throat> of small farms grew fruit and vegetables. By 2020, 20% of small farms grew them. And the medium farms went from 24% growing them to 38%. And this boom was usually in well-watered areas on highways that connected urban markets. So it was a grassroots boom that took place in these favorable conditions areas. Another exciting story is that of the Zambia vegetable boom. We found that over one decade, one decade, 
200,000 small farmers entered commercial vegetable farming. And it was about double more that, can, that entered non-commercial vegetable farming. So there's a huge rush into vegetable farming. And that meant that in one decade, there was a 1.6 fold leap in commercial vegetable farms. And nearly all of them were small scale as well as medium scale, but mainly small scale. And to handle that massive increase of vegetables, there was a rapid entry of wholesalers. Total sales in wholesale markets leapt 400% in 10 years. So this is a gigantic boom that's occurring. There was a massive entry of input agri-dealers uh, to provide the inputs like fertilizer and pesticides and new seeds and irrigation equipment to these hundreds of thousands of new farmers. And this again, just as in Tanzania occurred where the water uh, situation was sufficient and it was near highways and it was linked to urban markets. So these were the enabling conditions. The final story comes from Bart Minton and others work in on TEF in Ethiopia, a remarkable story of a tripling of these hidden middle actors in 10 years of wholesalers and truckers. And while they were entering the market and increasing the size of their trucks and their operation, there were, despite the fact that there was an elimination of uh, transport fuel subsidies, there was actually a rapid decline in transport cost margins. There was also rapid intake, uptake at the farm level of inputs uh, like fertilizer and new varieties of TEF by the farmers. There was a rapid growth of wholesale market volumes. There was a rapid growth of women's processing employment in micro and small and medium enterprises. So we have these two examples of vegetables and of TEF just as a flavor for the uh, case studies that we have in the report. To wrap up, we can think quickly about the policy implications of all of this. We think that the policy debate needs to refresh and take into uh, account the dynamism that already exists along value chains across Africa where the enabling conditions are present. This doesn't negate the important story of the challenges and the shortfall in nutrition that exists in both these kinds of products in Africa. But instead, to add to that debate, to think about the fact that there's very rapid dynamism that's occurring in both supply and demand. And secondly, the policy debate needs to recognize that this dynamism is grassroots, a product mainly of domestic micro, small and medium enterprises, uh, farms and midstream. And these enterprises are already investing mightily in spreading and growing. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel based on a myth that there's a missing middle. The value, ch the value chain midstream is not missing, it's hidden. And in our review of meso booms uh, in many places in Africa, we found consistently absent a direct hand of the government or provision of subsidies. We found absent NGO microcredit actions. We found absent contracts with large companies. We found absent special economic zones or agroparks. What did we find present? We found consistently present the enabling condition, the blood and bones the wholesale markets, roads, electrification, the uh, very interesting actions of National Agricultural Research System in uh, providing adapted breeds of animals and varieties of vegetables. We found that there was often a minimum at least of security from conflict and violence. Although we found very constantly, even in these boom situations, a consistent wish by these entrepreneurs for more freedom from bribes and harassment. What does this imply for the research agenda for uh, rethinking markets? Four things. One is more research on the organization development and constraints and needs of these spontaneous clusters uh, that are the underpinning of the meso booms. We also need more research on what's constraining the further growth and proliferation of these booms. Uh, we've showed that the supply is more or less keeping track with population in some products exceeding it in dairy and in chicken, for example, but in some just keeping track. What's holding it back? It's already taken off, as Usman Badian would say, the, the jet has taken off, but it could fly 
higher and faster. What are those constraints in terms of transaction costs, input costs, risks, cl conflict, climate problems? We need more research also on the implication of these booms for employment of youth and women and poverty alleviation overall. And finally, we need more research on impacts and issues of food safety and hygiene and environment that are involved in these meso booms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. As always, an exciting talk, just by the number of exclamation marks on the on the slides, but uh, very clear on the signaling this 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 exciting dynamics taking place in fruits and vegetables and all source foods uh, uh, markets. Um, but also um, underlining that we need a fresh approach to policy making, um, particularly focusing, and that's been the critical factor that you mentioned. It's about the enabling conditions, not policymakers trying to organize the um, missing middle or the hidden middle, um, as you mentioned, but focusing on the blood and bones of infrastructure uh, like electricity, water, and, uh, uh, and uh, the organization of wholesale markets. Also, thanks for the research questions. I think they're at the heart of the rethinking uh, uh, markets initiatives, but uh, initiative, but we need to uh, dig a, little, a lot more deeper into them. What kind of innovations are already taking place? What changes are already taking place uh, before promoting uh, new changes uh, in the uh, in these uh, sectors of the food system, uh, particularly in Africa? So uh, many thanks for that. Um, in my interaction, right? forgot to mention, but it's uh, you can find it in the uh, chat box. Uh, there's a link also to the discussion forum that we have set up under the KISM, the Knowledge Platform for Inclusive and Sustainable uh, Food Markets. Uh, I invite you to uh, click on that link and uh, submit your questions and a number have already come in uh, through that uh, channel. So now, with further, without further ado, let me hand over the floor to our uh, commentators, uh, starting with Christy Cook, and then followed by Diana Olney. Uh, Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Thanks for um, inviting me to discuss this really strong synthesis paper. Uh, my task is uh, was made easier because Tom gave an early presentation to our bureau at the invitation of our current. Um, assistant to the administrator, uh, Dina Esposito, who's a former student of his. So I think these results are being really well noted in the agency, not just because our leadership has heard them, but also um, it's really rich in data and the recommendations are insightful. So uh, as many of you know, our Bureau is responsible for the implementation of the Feed the Future initiative. The production, distribution, and consumption of nutrient-dense foods is really important for all three Feed the Future Initiative high-level goals, which are reduce poverty, reduced hunger, and improved nutrition. This paper contributes to our understanding of the pathways to achieving these goals and including critical policy implications. Uh, USAID, primarily or particularly through its country-based missions, works, works fairly extensively with these value chains through our research activities, such as our innovation labs for horticulture, livestock systems, animal health, and food safety, among others, and through our policy and our market system programs. For example, Tom referred to fruits and vegetables in Tanzania. Um, when USAID first started the partnership with Taha, the Tanzanian Horticultural Association, 17 years ago, was an organization of just five individuals in northern Tanzania. Now it's 18,000 individuals across the country. So this example, it does have a component of subsidization through its support for that association. However, Taha has become a highly effective advocate for an effective enabling environment. And I got to see that in person once in Tanzania as they were working on a ban on plastic bags, which was seriously going to affect the horticultural industry. Um, and to cite a, a research example as well, uh, USA works with government and national agricultural research institutes to improve the research and availability of new technologies. 
uh, through a market systems activity, we're working with Afrofruit and Mozambique to extend the harvest window for mangoes by introducing new varieties. They'll contract 1,200 smallholders, many headed by women, uh, the farms headed by women to increase the volume of variety of mango exports. We also work across many countries with producers and firms to grow the availability of animal source foods. In Uganda, processors have a difficult time sourcing sufficient supplies of milk. The Feed the Future Inclusive Agricultural Markets activity partnered with Patacente to pilot uh, e-procurement and factoring services to aggregators, buyers, and smallholder farmers in the dairy value chain, uh, which is a particularly challenging uh, value chain given the perishability. Due to the expansion of the factoring services to Southwest Uganda, uh, which is one of the Feed the Future areas, Patacente added an extra seven buyer factories and an extra 18 principal ag aggregators reaching over 100 milk warehousing centers. These technologies face challenges such as internet connectivity, but they are accelerating the growth of avail availability of animal source foods. And there's other technologies that we are, are trying to scale up um, that grow these value chains. We also work on stimulating consumption through social behavior change and other approaches. Um, and we're working on food safety issues, but Rather than talk exactly what we're doing, let's talk about um, how the paper is useful because of the recommendations. One of the important structures of the paper is that the growth occurred without direct interventions by governments or donors. So information such as this helps us to adapt our approaches to build on what is already ongoing locally. I think we are aware of the not so hidden middle. Uh, we're working to accelerate its growth, decrease um, income, employment, and um, and uh, nutrition impacts. Uh, but a few thoughts for discussion, and you've mentioned some of the, um, the research that might be forthcoming. So first you attest to the importance of the enabling environment, the bones and blood, especially roads, electrification, as well as some physical infrastructure such as hotel, uh, wholesale and retail market spaces. This environment is fundamental coming from the policy division. I, I don't just say it, I also believe it. And most of these investments are fundamentally public goods. So we as development partners have to work closely with governments to determine the appropriate roles. We can build infrastructure, we can support the establishment capacity and functioning of government systems to improve maintenance, efficiency and equity in the use of those services. We can provide technical expertise in contracting, technical specifications, even management. But governments must provide the appropriate policy environment for the private sector to fully benefit from that infrastructure. Can we build on analyses such as the, this to provoke more of a discussion in countries about the appropriate division between public and private provision of services? A more, um, you know, a second point would be a more in-depth analysis of both the extent and sources of the westernization of vegetables would be useful. Is this the equivalent of the maize transformation, the substitution for millets and sorghums over the past century that we are now experiencing in vegetables? Is it inevitable? I feel there is uh, possibly some anthropological rural social work out there that can be mined and used by the CG. Another point, many of these products can be input intensive, water resources in particular. Uh, Tom did allude to this. What are the challenges and solutions going forward, giving changes in climate trends and growing uncertainty? And what are policy recommendations that can make these value chains more climate smart? It would also be useful, again, as, as one of the policy implications that Tom already mentioned, to understand the demographic uh, participation and the distribution of benefits along these value chains, particularly from a gender perspective. Fruits and vegetables were often turned women's crops. Women provided much of the labor for the horticultural industry in Kenya, for example. We have lots of other examples. How inclusive are these value chains as they grow? Is there a, are there significant barriers to entry for certain groups? So it's much easier to ask questions than provide the answers, um, but a paper that stimulates so many thoughts and issues is clearly an important contribution. So thank you so much to the many authors for this work, uh, for the synthesis of the work and for inviting me to comment on it. 
over to you, Rob. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Christy, for these, uh, well, in, on one hand, heartening uh, to see the uh, remarks, uh, to see that the uh, USAID is already uh, recognizing uh, some of the findings uh, of uh, of this work and uh, focusing its support to various supply chains in Africa in this direction. And also good to say that the um, case of Uganda you cited, so it's also a case study for the initiative where we particularly look at innovations for improving uh, quality and would be important to see also how we can also link that to uh, the intervention that you're supporting through e-procurement, uh, as you mentioned. Also, thank you for the comments regarding the research directions. Uh, I think they're uh, truly spot on, particularly, well, how uh, can we generate better these uh, public-private partnerships for providing uh, the elements that are needed for the enabling environment, uh, but also, uh, um, well, what can we say more about input intensity of the um, um, the nutrient dense foods, the implications for the westernization of the of the diets, and particularly also in the end, of which also a core part of the initiative. Uh, who who gains? Uh, how inclusive uh, is the is this dynamics that we're seeing uh, on the ground? So thank you for those comments, and uh, no doubt uh, Tom will have some. Uh, things to say in response to that. But before that, let me move to Diana Olney for her comments uh, from her perspective, uh, probably also some a different perspective from somebody who's a, a lead nutrition expert uh, at IFPRI. Over to you, Diane. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rob, and, and thanks, Tom and team, for an excellent paper. Uh, yes, I mean, coming from the nutrition perspective, you know, my primary question is, you know, despite all this growth, there doesn't seem to be so much change. I mean, there is, you know, an increase in, in consumption of fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, but it's still nowhere near the levels that are required, that are recommended. And so I guess the big question is, you know, is there anything that can be done to support the growth that we are seeing to actually meet the recommended levels of consumption and, and intake, what more is needed? I think the answer will likely, unlikely be, you know, more infrastructure and, and roads and, and, and those kinds of things. I think that will continue to uh, support the, the growth and, and output and production, but what will it take to actually uh, get consumers to, to buy and eat the, these uh, high value foods? Second, you know, I, I wonder, you know, about trade-offs, you know, what are the trade-offs? I, you know, I heard, I read and heard a lot about kind of the poll from the urban population centers and the demand uh, for uh, increased access to fruits and vegetables, animal source foods. And I worry a bit about, you know, if, if infrastructure and all of that improves, it seems that there may be further pull to urban environments, there may be more profitable act, you know, activities in, in urban environments, which may pull more of the resources from rural populations. And so I guess I would you know, like to hear a little bit about thoughts on kind of trade-offs by improving profitability and, and, and access in urban environments, what would be the effects on rural populations? It seems that thus far, the, the differences between urban and rural populations is highly variable because across context, but it'd be nice to hear a bit about kind of the thinking and if, if there'd be anything need, needed to be done from a policy perspective to ensure that the rural uh, populations have equitable access to nutritious, diverse uh, foods. Another trade-off that I wonder about is, you know, the westernization of the, especially thinking about fruits and vegetables, and what are the implications there for biodiversity, environmental health, uh, things like that? You know, again, I think there's a pull towards profitability and and I worry a bit about, you know, what does that mean in terms of preserving biodiversity and diversity of, of diets and, and things like that? A big question that came to mind for me is also, you know, I, I think I heard a lot about, you know, what's what's not needed, you know, in terms of support from governments, from donors, from, you know, non-governmental organizations. But I guess my question is what is needed? You know, how can 
donor support? How can government support? What are the policy needs? You know, is it are there more specific ideas about what is needed in terms of research and innovation? Um, so that there can be a little bit more specific guidance. I mean, as Rob mentioned, I also lead the Fruits and Vegetables for Sustainable Healthy Diets Initiative. And, and you know, we're very much working on issues around food loss and waste and hygiene and, and you know, markets and value chains, um, working with traders in different contexts. And so it'd be, you know, interesting to hear, you know, from this research, what are some of the key, you know, specific ideas of where things like research initiatives or um, government policies can, can really play a role in supporting uh, these, you know, grassroots efforts and also bridging the gap, you know, between the markets and the consumers. And then lastly, I just like to reiterate the point on the inclusive growth and, and really trying to understand better, you know, what are the opportunities for women and youth and, and how can we, you know, as a community, support the inclusion of women and youth in these value chains, not just for providing labor and inputs, but also for uh, their own their own growth and their own kind of um, agency around this sector. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there and, and turn it back to, to Rob. But yeah, thanks so much for an excellent paper. Thanks, uh, Diana. Also excellent uh, questions and challenging questions, I would say, but I think well, maybe the first uh, point where you started off, well, all this massive growth, is it, is it enough? But probably it's not enough. So what's needed to accelerate? And you raise some further additional questions towards the end. But also important is to uh, to think about the trade-offs. So is, is the improving the enabling environment not driving up inequality or favoring urban areas more than the rural areas? And what would it mean for the dietary shifts at cost maybe also of traditional uh, foods, uh, local foods, as well as the possible trade-offs with, um, with biodiversity uh, um, uh, where it comes to uh, you know, what also uh, Chrissy mentioned about uh, input use, um, uh, water, water use in particular, and what it may mean for um, scarcity uh, of those resources for agricultural production. Um, so yeah, maybe the, the bigger question back to Tom is, okay, uh, we know probably, or you've emphasized what not to do, um, now what uh, should be needed to accelerate these changes, but particularly also to deal with those potential trade-offs as well as uh, to accelerate further uh, this growth that we need for uh, achieving sustainable and healthy diets. Um, so before I give it back to you, Tom, for, for first let me mention to everybody that is also in the chat, the link to the paper is there, so you see the full paper. Uh, and there are also a few uh, questions that I'd like to add that has come in uh, through um, the chat and through the discussion forum. Uh, first, uh, maybe you could start there, Tom, is a bit of clarification on the, the data, the big numbers you mentioned, so there's questions about uh, where do these numbers come from? Do they cover all countries? Um, and uh, more specifically, uh, we talked about 60% um, of fruits and vegetables are consumed and animal source foods are consumed in urban areas. Is that by volume or by cost? Maybe just a quick clarification. But then um, maybe also more interesting, uh, you, because you talked about the symbiosis between the hit and middle and the um, and the farmers. Um, so how does it work? For, for instance, in the Zambia case, um, where the farmers um, organized through cooperative and associations that um, stimulated this symbiosis, or is it all about um, individual traders and uh, other actors in the in the middle with individual farmers? So how important is um, uh, beyond what governments can do is the organization, uh, both of at the farm level and uh, at the in the middle level. So that's I think an important question that also came out from the chat. So with that, over to you, Tom, for some responses, and then I'll also give it back to Christy and um, Diana to follow up on some of the issues uh, in further response to uh, what you have to say. Back to you, Tom. Thank you very much. 
<clears throat> fantastic discussions and uh, from the two discussants and um, comments and questions from the participants. I think I'll um, start with a general point uh, which related to Diana's um, point about this is we've we've talked about the growth, but we should understand that there's still a shortfall and a and a problem, and I think that this is an essential paradox to keep front and center in the debate, and we're really presenting it as a paradox that <clears throat> uh, in in a way we're trying to sort of balance the debate. Uh, it's very important to think about challenges in uh, the constraints in the supply chains, the constraints at the farm level, the constraints at consumers understanding uh, the need to consume more of these important products. Uh, and the debate is very importantly, but highly focused on the shortfall and the constraints. The reason that we're emphasizing the other side of the coin is that there's been tremendous dynamism, faster than Asia, uh, you know, a boom, even at a, a world experience level, we've observed a number of booms in the increase of supply, both at the macro level, these huge rushes, 200,000 small farmers joining vegetable production. We're, sh we're seeing earth shaking booms of the type we saw in Asia. And bringing that onto the, uh, onto the radar screen, more centrally and pushing it is not meant to uh, say that the problems are solved. Rather to say, wow, this thing can be working uh, in certain situations where the conditions are present, it is working. And to, emphasize, to then ask the question, what are those conditions? Why did it work? How can the conditions be multiplied? And think of it that way rather than, uh, you know, things are not working, which might seem to imply that nothing is happening or that things are stuck in the mud. That image has crept into and become central in the debate when the real situation is very rapidly moving train. The train is mainly just staying up with population growth in most products and in some products blasting way ahead of population growth. So to say, okay, what we're working it with is a situation of a lot of successes that are have not been engineered by artificial means that are bubbling up. Why are they bubbling up? Where are they bubbling up? How can they bubble up more? Okay, that's the general feeling of this thing. A second point is the inclusiveness of this. And both of the discussants talked about this. What we found is that it, there's amazing inclusion stories on demand and supply sides. And there has to be more understanding of it. But on the demand side, <clears throat> a lot of poor people are eating more uh, vegetables. And vegetables is not a luxury product. It's really the poor are eating it. And we find it across the country, so zones in the country. And so uh, in that sense, the, these vegetable booms are helping the poor consumer. And they're eating it because the supply is equal to demand. It's not being exported. It's not being imported. So all these booms we're seeing are being eaten by the local people and very often spread over the quartiles of income distribution. The other exciting thing is that in many of these situations, we find that women and youth are absolutely knee deep in the booms. Okay, for example, chicken and eggs in Nigeria, uh, which I didn't talk about in the talk, it's a women's story. Okay, the women are heavily involved in the sales to the secondary cities, the tertiary cities of these products. Uh, in the TEF uh, boom, uh, it's women producing injera and processing TEF in, uh, in the cities, as well as in rural areas, as uh, there's youth as farmers. I could go on and on. And so laced throughout this is a real story of inclusion that's exciting and needs more emphasis and more study. Third. I feel that in this very short talk, uh, we tried to lay out specific things and much more thought has to go into exactly what does all this mean? And I really liked uh, Christie's point about, uh, you know, wholesale markets. I, 
I, I have to say, because I worked with somebody from one of the international NGOs and he was going around to different governments in Africa. And we agreed that he would ask all in all these government fora, what is their wholesale market policy, investments, problems, issues, and trajectory? And he said, everywhere he, they went, they said, huh? What are you talking about? What are the wholesale markets? What, what is the point? We just did a big study for USAID of wholesale markets in, in uh, Tanzania. And uh, basically we found that um, even though there was some knowledge of wholesale markets, it was unbelievable what was not discussed and known about even the situation of wholesale markets uh, and how rapidly they uh, proliferated because many of them were semi-informal and a lot of it's off the radar screen because it's municipal and district led. So the national government didn't know. So there's a lot of room for policy. If I use the word, I don't know, I can never tell what's in, in, in the, the current okay thing to say, but policy advocacy, you know, that uh, th there should be massive public a uh, policy advocacy by the donors, by uh, the international institutions for governments to really tackle this thing. I have seen it country after country. It's a big gaping uh, hole in the public discussion. Unbelievable, really. And so the fact that USAID could work with technical assistance, et cetera, uh, to do that better, you know, even without building new wholesale markets, this is heartening and wonderful. And I think that the NARS, the National Agricultural Research Systems, and of course the CGAR, uh, you know, working on varieties that are tropicalized vegetable, you know, tropicalized uh, chickens, uh, like the Neuler in Nigeria. Uh, these sorts of varieties have been central to, in, including the kinds of teff in, in Ethiopia, these have been central to the rapid adaptation to the local conditions. Water, third, water, water, water. I feel like over and over in all of these stories, uh, there's an issue of under in, uh, under investment, uh, lack of you know sufficient water. But where water was present, and very often it was the farmers themselves sinking the boreholes, etc. Thousands of them. Uh, there was a boom. Okay, how sustainable that is, how well it's done, is a different question. Fourth is a thing that's un unbelievably blinded in the debate, and we've argued this during the COVID time. Third party logistics. Everybody says truckers, warehouses, it's missing. Actually, there's a massive market in Africa for third-party logistics services. Unbelievable, it's already present. And we found, you know, in the maize case in Nigeria, 75% of the maize is moved by these third-party logistics. So transport policy, uh, Im import policy on spare parts, fuel policy, all of those are vegetable and fruit policies. All of those are animal product policies because those products are mainly being commercialized and demanded in supply chains that are dependent mainly on third-party logistics. So that has to be front and center. And another thing so important is that security, banditry, uh, bribes, this, came, this comes up constantly. That's a policy question. That's something that can be uh, dealt with, presumably. And so there's so many things that are very specific that could be done that can make this as Usman Badian says, the jet has already taken off, but it can fly uh, higher and faster. And I would say that uh, the biodiversity issue is very interesting. The truth is, and we have now these consumption paper in Senegal, we're just finishing another one in Tanzania, we've done this in Nigeria. Basically, a minority of fruit and vegetables consumed in Africa are the indigenous varieties. It's now 25%, let's say. Okay, the rest of it is so-called westernized uh, vegetables, which are from Latin America mainly, and you know some from Europe, et cetera. So that it's true that it's mainly in the green leafy vegetables, a portion of the green leafy vegetables, uh, which maybe is a 35% of the uh, total vegetables that you have um, in our consumer studies, that you have these diverse local products. And it's true that over time, several like, uh, uh, water leaf, et cetera, in Nigeria. These, there's a concentration over those in the winters that can be shipped or fluted pumpkin leaves in Ebonyi in our study there. The, these, uh, there's winters there too. So even just as in the West, so-called West, uh, there's been winners among the vegetables 
there's also some winners among the, the the biodiverse products that are really taking over and concentrating and those that are moved and most interest, interesting to the consumers, et cetera. So yeah, I don't think you're going to reverse that process of selection and concentration uh, that's going to take place. The issue is, are the local products able to stay up? Foreign products like mangoes, okay, these are not indigenous products, are can, you know, they, they become semi-indigenous, they can be adapted. So there's a lot of issues around, uh, uh, the fact is, is that tomatoes and onions are king in Africa, okay? And the reason is because consumer consumption dishes have changed. These are interchangeable and have penetrated many traditional dishes. So there's, and they also are amenable to long distance trade. And this is what we also showed in the report. Tomatoes are coming from a thousand kilometers to main consumption centers in Nigeria. Tomatoes are going from a few main production centers in Tanzania, all over Tanzania. Everywhere in Tanzania, they eat the same amount of tomatoes and onions, everywhere. Okay, so these, this idea that there's short supply chains for vegetables is no longer true in Africa. They're mainly long supply chains or medium length supply chains. So what can withstand that? I think you're gonna to come to the same issues as we had in California, I'm a Californian. Basically, uh, how do you, how do you breed uh, vegetables and fruits that are able to withstand, withstand longer shipment and still have the appropriate nutritional values? This is a big issue in the Indian National Agricultural Research System too, and they're breeding potatoes that can withstand storage and lengthy supply because the potatoes spread all over India. Potatoes are a totally non-traditional crop, obviously, in India. So these are important questions. I'm getting near the end. Basically, I think that Christie's point about public and private is absolutely central. In fact, one of our main um, emphasized points in this um, is that the private sector, not at the large level, really the large scale private sector is not involved in hardly any of this, nothing almost. It's all these medium, small, micro enterprises and they're investing heavily and they tend to invest where the public investment is assured so beautifully bought, brought out in the IFPRI and collaborators work in Ethiopia with TEF, where when the roads were better, the wholesale markets were better, the truckers and the wholesalers went wild investing, the farmers went wild investing. So it's that symbiosis and really bringing that out, dare I say, with policy advocacy, okay? And finally, <clears throat> this issue of clusters is so fascinating to me. I think that a lot of uh, excitement is uh, being brought to bear and it's, I see it over, you know, I'm an old guy, so over 30, 40 years, I see this come and go and come and go. This idea of integrated parks, integrated uh, development schemes, and then they're reborn as special economic zones and they're reborn as agro parks. These things are basically minor. Okay, that's my main point. Public schemes that are putting together these artificial centers of development get a lot of bling and a lot of uh, press while they're happening, but they're going to be 10% mass maximum of the story. The 90% are these others, and we find them in clusters. The farmers and the wholesalers and the logistics, they're often a little bit related to the secondary cities. This is coming back to Dina's point about the role of city versus town. Often there's a symbiotic relationship between these tertiary and secondary cities and this, this boom of these clusters around them. And what, what seems to be, and we need more research on this, these are not cooperatives. Cooperatives are unimportant in Africa, as far as we can tell in these products, a little bit here and there, basically not in vegetables and fruits, and you know probably very, very little in the other things. There's a few little bits here and there, but mainly it's a non-cooperative, not a cooperative story, but still there are these clusters and they seem to act in some semi-coordinated way. We're, one of our key research interests is understanding to what extent they coordinate. Who do they coordinate with? How are they formed? What is their trajectory? What are their needs and constraints and their impacts? I think that should be central, uh, one of the central topics in the research agenda as, as uh, discussed earlier. As Rob knows, I can talk on and on, but I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Tom.
yes, I do know that. But I think you you did a great job to to respond to all the issues that were raised and in passing also several of the um, further questions were raised in the in the chat, so particularly things related to to inputs, uh, seeds, water, um, importance. Uh, there was also a question raised on fertilizer access. Um, but uh, yeah, particularly also important to emphasize that in the optimistic story, there's also a lot of inclusion there, um, but there's still some questions and further research needed on uh, yeah, how can we drive this further to actually close a lot of the, the huge gaps that still exist in uh, access to the benefits from that uh, growth in the fruit and vegetable sectors and um, more study of, uh, of clusters and how that's being developed. Um, just we have uh, just uh, we're actually running over time, I just uh, had promised to give uh, some space also to Christy and Diana to give some final remarks in response to the overall uh, set of uh, issues and uh, the, the responses you just gave now. Um, so let me start with Diana, and maybe in passing can also answer one question that was uh, uh, directed uh, specifically to you uh, from um, Alan de Brouw regarding um, the, um, uh, what are the gaps currently in maybe specifically in the fresh countries that the, your initiative is working on in terms of um, what's needed in terms of for healthy diets and what's the actual consumption for fruits and vegetables. It does marks also maybe just to put further in perspective the dynamics uh, that we're seeing and the, uh, the, the first question that you raised also in response to Tom. Uh, so first over to you, uh, uh, Diana, and then uh, over to Christy for a final comment. Diana. Great, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep this very short. Um, yeah, so in, in response to Alan's question, in the four primary fresh countries we're working in, it's about 50%. So uh, estimated consumption is about 50% of availability of, of fruits and vegetables. Um, but the availability ranges quite a bit from you know, 110 or 20 percent to about 50 percent. So when you really get down to what does consumption look like, you know, 50 percent of 50 percent is is quite low. Um, and so I think that's it's still a big challenge. So there are some countries that have the supply challenge and need that growth and and output production, but there are other countries where output is is almost at least the recommended levels or a little bit above. But there's still this 50% gap between uh, consumption and, and availability. And that's at the population level, right? This is just aggregate consumption. It's not considering individual intake levels, which we know vary by population group. You know, and so I think there's still a lot of work to be done to, to kind of close those gaps. Um, some would likely be around food loss and ways, other around, you know, some of the trade-offs we talked about. Um, so I think, yeah, I would just like to close by saying I think, you know, there's a this is an excellent. Um, jumping off point to kind of think about, you know, that that uh, the value chains in the middle of the value chain. But I think we, you know, there's a lot we can do to work together to kind of work to close those gaps uh, towards the consumption side. Um, so I'll leave it there and turn it over to Christy. Thanks, Diana. Uh, over to you, Christy. Uh, and maybe you want to uh, also reflect a little bit on uh, the point uh, Tom particularly made at, at the end of his remarks on policy advocacy uh, uh, for yeah, the, the key findings from this paper and what USAID can do with that moving forward. Over to you, Christy. Yeah, um, well, I was actually sort of focused on some of Jenny's comments that um, because she is, is asking, I think, a really interesting question about the location of production and the consumption of product and how we generate that for those who actually need the product as well as um, you know, the, those in the urban area where the demand does seem to have been uh, growing significantly. Uh, I really think this comes down to infrastructure. Um, you need to have uh, the, the, the basic infrastructure in place. And that includes uh, electrification and it includes pumps for water. It, it includes a range of um, sort of technologies that uh, need to be distributed uh, more broadly. Um, 
I think much of this production is taking place around uh, urban areas and not just in the big cities, as Tom mentioned, but in secondary uh, areas. So do we, I think we do believe there's a role for advocacy. I think this type of work is important to demonstrate to policymakers that the, the growth happens, you can inhibit it or you can help it. Um, and what are those key elements uh, that are needed to uh, make the plane take off, basically? Um, and those are start, and I I would say, Tom, unfortunately, I'm not sure that the, the bribes um, and the security issues are as easy to tackle as you think. They could be, it seems like they could be, but there's an entire governance structure that's built around some of that. So I do believe we need to, to tackle that. We need to work with that. We need to partner more with um, those who are working on um, helping governments to establish this rules of law. But um, otherwise we, we need that investment um, in, we need the investment in the right areas. We need it in research and we need it in that basic infrastructure in terms of um, electricity systems that work, <laughs> internet that works um, and a road structure that is somewhat maintained because the private sector, I, I really think will do the rest. Um, and so whether the role of USAID in that, I mean, we can, uh, we we work on that regularly on how do we provide that evidence. We've supported policy research institutes in their local countries to try to generate that evidence and get it into policymaker hands. We form partnerships around that. So thanks again. That I'll conclude with that. No, thank thank you, Chrissy. I think that's a very good way to conclude uh, this this seminar. Um, I think we've heard um, uh, quite some interesting facts that people may not have appreciated uh, this way, but at the same time, uh, that, that doesn't mean all the good news story that the challenges uh, all have been overcome and that uh, so they're both on the policy side and on the research side, uh, quite a few um, issues to be uh, clarified further and quite a bit of work more to be done. And that's, uh, I guess, uh, a task for us to take up within the initiative as well as the fresh initiative and other CGIR initiatives. But uh, I think um, this was a very uh, stimulating uh, seminar, uh, both um, uh, from the findings that we've already seen, but particularly also uh, to think through these research questions uh, moving forward, and which we'll take on uh, in the um, further uh, course of, uh, of the initiative. So with that, let me thank um, uh, all of you as participants for joining in the seminar, particularly to Tom Reardon for uh, his um, both insightful and provocative presentation that helped uh, stimulate this discussion to Diane and, uh, Diana and Christy for their uh, excellent uh, comments and feedback, uh, which I hope will resonate also with us in terms of, and uh, we can follow through on that through our subsequent uh, research. So thank you all very much. Please follow the further um, the developments of the research uh, along these lines uh, through the Knowledge Platform, the, the KISM platform for which you have the link. And also, if you have further comments to make to today's discussion, please submit your questions to the discussion forum and we'll try and answer those questions also beyond this seminar. And here's the direct link for you. So with that, let me close the seminar and thank everybody again very much for their active participation in the seminar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody.